So I believe we've heard a lot of things just from the last talk that Imam Jihad gave. There's amazing things that you could take back. You could take one of, the, one of those points and try to work on them and you have success. Uh, my thing is I believe in incremental change. So out of everything that you heard in the weekend, pick one thing that you want to work on. A lot of times we burden ourselves beyond which Allah has burdened us with, right? Seeking perfection, Allah has not made you to be perfect, right? So pick one thing that you want to improve on and then increase on that. And please, for the sake of Allah, don't beat yourself up. One of the greatest weapons that shaitan uses is despair, right? That's, that's what he uses. Do not be in, in despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Incremental change. Hey, y'all gonna be wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Could I just add on to that question? Okay. Like, specifically, when we're, we get back into school, we kind of get taken over by like, school. So, how can we kind of. Yeah, I don't know. How can we account for that? Or, like, yeah, what can we do to account for that? Like, kind of consumption that we are, like, totally consumed by school. Okay. So. Uh, make sure you all strengthen your uh, MSAs, you know, strengthen your MSAs, make sure that there's a balance in your MSAs, make sure you have your, your weekly classes or, or whatever, and then strengthen your individual practice, okay? So for myself, uh, personally, uh, what changed my life, I would say, is that um, waking up an hour before uh, you know, Salat al-Fajr going to, to sleep earlier. I used to study all night. I, I would study in the night. And my days would not be productive. So I, I changed that around and I wake up. For example, I would wake up at five. That gives me an opportunity to do some review of Quran or something. And so I do some, uh, some, some work in regards to, um, uh, you know, my Islamic studies. Then perform uh, uh, Salat al-Fajr. And then I'll come out and I, and I take a walk or something and I just view, you hear the birds and everything, it's transformative. You all have to try this, okay? You have to try this. Schedule your life, don't, don't make sure that you schedule your life around the salah. Powerful waking up early in the morning. You know, a brother came to me, he said, oh, I saw this TED talk that, uh, you know, I should wake up at, at five in the morning. Man, it's in our dean, it's been in our dean. <laughs> You know, <laughs> what are you talking about some TED talk? <laughs> so, so we have to make sure that we begin to schedule our lives. Map out your day. Even if you have to wake up and set a schedule for yourself, map out your day. Make sure you're, you're fulfilling three things and you don't let anyone disrupt these three things. You have to make sure you're taking a class either weekly, twice a week, Take an Islamic studies class to make sure that your spirituality is staying at a certain level. So you're dealing with the spiritual. You have to make sure you're dealing with your health, okay? So even if it's working out once a week, you have to make sure that you go out and get some exercise, okay? And then you need help for your brain. We have a lot of mental illness in this, uh, in this world that we are susceptible to also being in this world. So uh, make sure that you Figure out some times that you can have your own seclusion away from uh, people or you take vacations, you need self-care, okay? So these three, should, three, these three things should never be disrupted. So making sure you schedule your lives properly and making sure that you don't disrupt the, those three aspects of your life. Hey, could you repeat the three things one more time? Okay, so you have to, uh, can we repeat them? Uh, spirituality. spirituality, so Islamic studies. I have to do an Islamic studies class five days a week. So I have a teacher and I have to do five days a week with him. And I don't let anybody disrupt, anybody disrupt me. I ask my wife and daughter. Sometimes, you know, they, they're like, man, you gonna do your class? And, yes, I have to do my class. And you need me to do my class. I don't wanna, I, it's too many terrible influences out here. I need this Islamic study. So number two, I have to work out, okay? I have to work out. So I'm doing, you know, five days a week. You have to either walk or get your jog on. Brothers, get in shape. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be a, a, a husband. You guys gonna get married one day. You, you gotta get in shape, brothers. Y'all got that? So making sure you, you know, get your, uh, your gym membership, start eating better, let go of the meat-based diet, bring more vegetables uh, into your diet. 
but get in shape. So make sure your physical health is good. This is all a part of the sunnah. And then also the third is what? Your mental health, okay? Take a break, Take put that the schoolwork, all of that stuff uh, alone, leave that stuff alone and take a break, okay? Uh, take vacations. I told the, the brothers um, yesterday that uh, me and my wife, we do a date night. You know, that's, we need that date night to preserve our relationship. So that's a, uh, that's a secret for all of us. That, that when you guys get married, make sure you do your date night. On a date night, you guys get dressed up and go to a place where you need valet parking. <laughs> and the restaurant is a little pricey. You know what I'm saying? Go do that, okay? The three things that really um, changed the course of my life when it came to maintaining spirituality was one, reading the Quran every single day in a language I understood. So not being Arab, and even if you are Arab, it's likely that you don't necessarily understand the Fusha. Um, read it in translation, one ayah a day. If you can't do more than that, just do one, but do it every single day. And if you cannot, um, if you can't, if you also, when you're on campus, use your headphones. When you're walking from class to class, listen to Quran and listen to it with a <coughs> translation so that you can just start to comprehend and feel connected to the message of the Quran. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, create a gratitude journal. So every single day, write three things that you're grateful for intentionally. Be intentional. Very small things, like I am grateful that I had milk for cereal today. I'm grateful that I saw the sun. I'm, I'm grateful that, alhamdulillah, I was not bitten by a bee. Anything that you can think of small, but psychologists have talked about doing uh, three pieces of gratitude on a daily basis for 27 days literally changes the neurons in your brain. Mm. So imagine if you did it on a regular basis. And the third thing is, um, it's really critical to read a book of seerah. And I know that Imam Abdullah talked about this um, yesterday beautifully, Barakallahu Feek. Um, there's a book that I would recommend called Muhammad Man and Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is like 800 pages, but it is so beautiful because you feel like you're walking with the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first three chapters are really dry, but when you get past those first three, it really feels like you're like with the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So being able to feel that when you're in the middle of campus, and you are being called to do a ton of different things and you're forgetting about Allah, but then you remember like, you know what? Like, I'm not alone because I have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with me and the people who died to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that for me. So being able to feel connected with them, inshallah, will give us strength to be able to maintain that Iman even when we're in spaces that maintaining it is very difficult. Yes, baby, I'm over here. <laughs> And also, let me just tell you, like, I know what it's like to be busy. I, I know what it's like to be super busy. Now I'm busier than I've ever been before. And the way I do my Quran uh, review is stoplights when the car is stopped because this kid doesn't give me space, mashallah. So I'm just saying, like, you can make time for it. So, alhamdulillah. Any other questions? What kind of advice do you have? I guess like on those days where you feel like your man is really weak, like you don't really feel like doing much, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just like the, uh, um, the days when you don't feel like working out, okay? Or sometimes we just don't work out at all. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I have days where I'm like, I, I don't want to work out. I, I literally just want to just sit here. That's the best day to do it. So that's the, you know, I think that, you know, you have to go against whatever that, that, that current that's driving you. I said, oh, why they like, hey, you take it. Oh, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. He's like, he's like, yeah. That's our leader. That's the one we've been waiting on. So, so alhamdulillah. So, so in those days, so that you have, that's why you have to have your routine that you do no matter what. That's going to sustain you. So you have your routine as far as, you know, with uh, Quran, you have, as they would call a, um, um, you know, a regular dua that you perform daily, okay? Got, and that I you got, don't break, so keep your routine. Oh, okay. <laughs> he got some advice too. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. That's, that's perfect, so we'll move on. Next question. Um, on, a, on a different note, I was curious as to what you guys thought about being politically active, especially in light of 2016, of 2018, the fact that Muslims are only about 
of this of this country's population. You know, there's two Muslim congressmen. What advice and thoughts do you have on that, um, and kind of your recommendations for that? Um, so in Atlanta, I spent uh, Allah Subhanahu afforded me uh, some time to spend with the state uh, legislation committee and other things. Um, so what I see is um, a lot of us. We spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the 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 federal government and things like that. What I want young people to do is focus on your local city level, volunteer, make the Muslim presence very visible in your local community, right? So for example, um, in LA County, if you go to LA County uh, website or even talk to people that are in the inner cities, they'll be able to tell you there is a bunch of things that you can do for the city where you can go as a Muslim, you can go as sisters in hijab, just make your presence felt. And the reason I say that is based on this. I call it street credit, okay? Muslims don't have street credit. That's why somebody can go and talk about you, talk smack about you, and nobody, everybody believes it. But if you look at the Prophet ﷺ, even before he was ordained as the Prophet, even before that he was known as a Sadiq al Amin, he had mad street credit. So when they went to, uh, you know, to the old man and they gathered around, they said, okay, how can we vilify his character? And somebody said, well, let's call him a magician. He said, that's not going to work because the people know him too well. He said, well, let's call him this. You know, he said, that's not going to work. Anything that they threw at him, anything that they used to vilify, they said his presence in society is too visible. People know him too well. Today, Muslims are not visible. Make your presence visible. You can form, there's what is called a local organizing uh, committee that you can uh, form. Um, so we have a local organizing committee, and what we do, we do, uh, um, we'll do prayer visuals when something happens um, that needs our voice. We'll, we'll do uh, press conferences, and we do it right there at our, uh, at our space to make sure at least, yeah, like uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, you mentioned that you, we stay visible and stay active. I think there was a time that, you know, especially uh, African Americans, we're very suspicious of the political system. You know, we don't like, you know, a lot of times we have uh, individuals who don't like to vote. We don't trust the uh, political system a lot of times. But we found out that um, we have to be individuals. Even if we don't uh, vote, we have to make sure that we engage, that we engage so we transition from a model where, for example, the imam would lead a community and doesn't even know their local council person, okay? Now we're trying to shut down liquor stores in our community. We're trying to shut down, now the big thing in South Los Angeles are the weed dispensaries, okay? They're replacing the liquor stores. These liquor stores, some of them are owned by Muslims. We want them shut down. So we have to engage this political system and gain clout so we can shut all of that stuff down in our community and make that into Muslim town right there. So we have to engage. This question is, should we prevent ourselves from committing an act of worship if we doubt our intention? The way that I would look at your intention is in general, try to renew it in a general way. You ask Allah and Salah to keep you sincere. You ask Allah to make you sincere when you're going to an event. Um, but when you're not sure if you're going to pray, for example, because everyone else is praying, pray anyway. Any time that you know you're going to do something good and you're not sure if it's 100% sincere, ask Allah to make you sincere, but do it anyway. And if for some reason you recognize that later on that action actually wasn't for Allah, you realize that your intention was doubtful for sure, you're positive, you changed your intention and it wasn't for the sake of Allah, retroactively ask Allah to forgive you and ask Allah to accept it anyway and ask Allah to give you the strength to be sincere the next time. Because if you stop something for the sake of protecting yourself from, insin from, protecting yourself from potentially being insincere, it's an act of riyah. If you do it and you're trying to be sincere and you're struggling through that, inshallah you'll be greatly not only rewarded but also the person who is on the battlefield, that person is not only gaining so much more uh, not only supporting their community and getting so much more reward, but they're also struggling against themselves and becoming better so much more so than the person who's staying at home because they're trying to protect their, in, their, their, their intention. 
So work, but when you know you messed up, retroactively try to, uh, to, to, to change that and then use that to help you inform your actions for the next time. Yeah, yeah. Just str struggle through it. You know, they, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they talked about an individual who, um, you know, would pray at night, you know, but he would commit larceny during the daytime. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that prayer will eventually overcome that sin. So I'm telling you all that, you know, straight up struggle through it. All of us are trying to, to you know, find our way out of ma'asiyah, of some type of sin. You know, we're all doing something that we're trying to figure out how to get out. So struggle through it. Make sure you come up with a plan. If you're deep in a sin, you come up with a plan. What we found is that trying to quit something cold turkey, you end up going back to that thing as soon as some type of sadness or uh, you're reminded of it, you end up going back to that particular sin. So in some instances, you have to wean yourself off of that particular sin gradually and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we see the individual who he uh, killed 99 people Allah blessed him because he was on his way towards repentance he was on his way to a land toward you know towards uh, repentance so make sure that you continue on your way you may not be completely out but stay on your way and Allah will bless uh, that and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyone who's in that state we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify their affairs for them. Say, I mean. So I just want to add on to that. I shared with the brothers last night, my personal struggle, one of the biggest struggles coming out of high school was music. Okay, not the nonsense music that we listen to nowadays. I'm talking about classical music. Okay, like Marvin Gaye and them. Like Aretha Franklin. Old school. Things that, you know, they, when men, men, men they sang, they actually cried. That, those type of songs. I had a very difficult time. And sometimes the mousey and the sins that we are involved in they are, they, they accumulate over time and they become bigger than ourselves. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, uh, there's a book um, called Habits by Charles Duhigg. He talks about something very important. First thing is you have to figure out what are your triggers. Yeah. A lot of times we're trying to fix the problem, but you don't know what triggers the problem. Yeah. You got to figure out what your trigger is. Sometimes it's the dumb friends that we keep around us. Sometimes it's just being bored, or at least we think we're bored. You have to find the triggers. The, thing, the problem with young people is we don't think, right? We just, we, we, you think we just, no, there are habits that build up. So for me personally, support group. The Prophet Sallallahu utilized this. Get a support group, people that are, that are your confidants in life. And there are very few in life. Find them, find them. People that love you and invest in you for who you are, with your faults, right? who want better for your dean. A support group is very important. People that, you know, like, they'll set you straight. That you can call and be like, look, man, last night I was talking to this girl, you know, all night, and this morning I miss Fudger. And they're gonna give it to you. You know, people like that, a support group is very, very important. No, I, I, <clears throat> just look at your sin as a habit. It's just a habit that you need to, to rework. And they both mentioned that beautifully. But just look at it that way instead of this thing that I can't control. It's just a habit you need to change. We have uh, five minutes, inshallah. Five minutes. Um, inshallah, we learned a lot this weekend, but if you could choose one thing that you would like us to remember, what would it be? Each one of us? No, I haven't even been here. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so, so I mentioned uh, the... the it's like, no. <laughs> man, I love it, man. I'm going to do that all around the country, man. Nobody's going to forget it. I, I was actually, I was in, uh, in New Jersey. Same way, I was on a panel in New Jersey last week. When I say it's like, <laughs> so we rocking all around the country with that. Okay, so Alhamdulillah. <laughs>
فَتَرْضَى So Allah mentions in the Qur'an, Allah is going to give to you and you are going to be pleased. Okay? So that's one, you know, as they, one of the uh, companions said, this is the most hopeful ayah in Qur'an. This is the most hopeful verse in Qur'an that Allah is going to give to you. It's very simple to remember. Allah is going to give to you and you are going to be pleased. Don't despair even in the state that you are in right now. Allah is training you. You are being trained. Don't despair. Allah is going to take many of us to the brink of suffering. But it's only for us to submit and humble ourselves and realize that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. Don't despair. Ali ibn Abi Talib, an individual who was despairing over their sin, Ali, uh, he mentioned to them, he said that um, perhaps the, the, your despair over that sin is a greater sin than the actual sin. Okay? So we have to make sure that we are not in despair. Don't allow people to cause you to fall so guilty. One of my friends who was murdered, who was murdered, towards his last days, he came to outside of the masjid. He didn't want to go in because he felt that he was too dirty. He had too much filth on him to go inside of the masjid. He had committed too much sin to go inside of the masjid. And talking to my other friend, I said, I wish I was there. I wish I was there to just talk to him. So make sure, don't, don't allow people to make you feel terrible that you can't bounce back. Islam has the greatest comeback stories. So you can always come back. Allah is going to give to you and you will be what? Please. Please, Alhamdulillah. Uh, so just the same thing, Alhamdulillah. Um, I'll just share with you something. My first thing is, in your search for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let go of all bias that you have. A lot of times we can't find them because the paradigm that we're looking from is we have, you know, it, it, we have obstacles. You have to remove. If you want to find Allah, Allah promised you can find Allah. He will lead you to Him, right? He will lead you, but you have to remove. I have to remove bias that we have within our hearts. As young people, we go through emotional trauma with family. We go through emotional trauma with, with boyfriends, girlfriends. You know, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and what happens? We blame it on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. The Sahaba, Muslims in the past, faced worse than that, right? They faced worse than that, but they never had a bias against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that will help you to come out of, of difficult things. Um, there's a famous scholar by the name of Hassan al-Basri, as Imam Jihad was saying, I've not ever despair. You know, there were times that I, I felt like, man, I messed up so bad, you know, there's no way, you know, like, I could redeem myself. And I remember my teachers, you know, sharing with me that there was one time Hassan al-Basri, he was the sheikh. And again, like, these are just titles. Just, we're, not, we're not taught in Islam to put people on pedestal. When the Prophet walked into a gathering, when he entered Medina, they couldn't differentiate who's Abu Bakr and who's, who's Muhammad. When he sat amongst people, they couldn't recognize who Muhammad Sallallahu was. But nevertheless, Hassan al-Basri being the, the scholar of his time, once he was giving a talk and he said, oh people, keep on knocking on the door of Allah, keep on <coughs> knocking on the door of Allah, eventually he will open the door. There's an elderly mother in the back, she started crying. He approached and he says, Ya Ummah, what happened? My mother, what happened? What did I say that you, it, it caused you to cry? And she said, Hassan, I'm old in age. I spent my entire life. I spent my entire life Today you said, keep on knocking on the door of Allah, eventually He will open it. Hassan, I spent my entire life, but I never knew the doors of Allah subhanahu wa ever closed. Allah's doors are not closed. They are not closed. And Hassan corrected himself. He said, you're right. The doors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are never closed. Nobody can close them. So don't ever despair. Keep your head up. <coughs> Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with both answering this question and and relate that uh, to to one thing to take away. The Quran says, "Have mercy on them both, as they cared for me when I was young." Regarding parents, what if your parents were emotionally and physically abusive, and they forced you to do things that you were not comfortable with? 
Um, it's really important when we talk about parents' rights, generally, speakers make statements like, your parents know you the best, your parents love you, they want the best for you. And while that might be true in many cases, that's not true of all parents, and that's not true of all relationships, and it's not fair for people on stage to say statements like that because it alienates so many families who, are in, who have inherited trauma. So when, when we talk about um, respecting your parents, we're talking about parents who respect their duties towards you. They need to fulfill a covenant towards you as well. If they're abusive towards you, if they're negligent towards you, those, will, those are all areas where their rights can be questioned or challenged based on the situation. So it's really critical for you to speak to not just an imam, yes, speak to an imam, and to speak to a therapist. Seek a Muslim therapist who is aware of Islamic law, who can help you process um, the, 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 the trauma of dealing with this as, as a child, but also knowing what next steps to take, especially if you're in this age group. This question comes a lot when it comes to marriage and how you have to deal with your families and whether or not you need to have their permission because of the fact that, you know, they, they haven't put you in a place where you feel comfortable coming to them, even with potentially the person you're considering. All of those things factor in based on how they have maintained their obligation towards you. So seek therapy and speak to an imam about your specific situation. Um, and also, I just want to reiterate what, um, what, what, what our um, beloved imams have just said, that I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to who have trauma with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have it because of their understanding of how a parent figure should be. And they assume that Allah, you know, Allah is all capable as parents should be towards for their children, take care of them. And they project this relationship that they've had with their parents onto Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not your father and he is not your mother. He is your creator. And in he and he and he is not out to get you. He is not waiting to punish you. He is not waiting for you to mess up so that everything can go wrong in your life. And he is not not answering the depths of the dua that you make in your heart. And when you're making that dua, you're thinking, well, I know he's not gonna answer it anyway because he knows how badly I want this thing. He has over and over told us how when we make dua to him, he responds and he listens and he is the answerer. So instead of coming to Allah with this preconceived notion of how you've been treated by parents or spiritual abuse or spiritual leaders or other Muslims who've judged you, Go to Allah by his names. There's a beautiful series a friend of mine wrote on virtualmosque.com, virtualmosque.com. It's the Names of Allah series. The Names of Allah series, Dr. Jinan Yusuf wrote it. She, um, you can take one article a week, they're very short. Take one name of Allah that's unrelated to the trauma that you've experienced. So for example, if it's, um, if, you're, if, you're, if the frustration that you have dealt with your parents um, comes from a place of trust, don't focus on that specific name yet. Focus on the name like Al-Jamil and look at the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how that relates to your life and how that relates to your relationship with Him and work in that way until you get to know Him from a place without preconceived notions that are based on your experiences with people in power in your life. And then inshallah, slowly through that process, inshallah, hopefully, your shift of experiencing your relationship with Allah when couched in fear and trauma will inshallah slowly shift to one of hope and excitement and love and inshallah through that process as well you'll start to feel more healing in the relationship that you've experienced with your parents as well yeah, this could be the last question it's the same <coughs> virtual mosque same concept, yeah. virtual mosque dot, dot com yeah. yes so this is the same concept. We're seeing questions regarding parents. Um, so the, the, I, my first thing is, <clears throat> I met my father for the first time, okay? When I was eight years old. Now, imagine not having a person in your life and eight years old, there's this person said, hey, you know, how you doing? I'm your dad. And I'm like, <laughs> I knew he existed, but it took me a long time to accept him into my life. Now I love him. Now I can't go a day without kissing him. Now I love him. But if you looked at me in high school, I couldn't stand that man. Okay? But he, but he always wanted good for me. But my, my, my main point is, don't make rash decisions when it comes to parents. 
<clears throat> I think all of us would agree, we can't give you a open and a statement and just say this is how it works. You have to seek uh, counseling in your particular situation so that it can be addressed adequately and sufficiently and efficiently. Uh, but one, one thing overall is Allah subhanahu wa says very simply, وَإِن جَاهَدَكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِعِلْمْ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ And this kind of helped me as I went through life. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if jihad means if your parents make jihad on you, which can be translated into some sort of abuse. If they make jihad on you, they are forcing you to do something. Here in this particular verse, if they're forcing you to commit shirk, so it means something really majorly wrong. Something majorly wrong, right? Not like saying, hey, hey, uh, Khalid, can you go cut the grass? You're like, astaghfirullah, jihad ka'ala al-tushrika bi. Right? N nothing like that. If it's something severely wrong, even then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا What's amazing here in Arabic, fa, there's a difference between saying, جَاءَ خَالِدْ جَاءَ خَالِدْ وَأَحْمَدْ Wa usually means Khalid and Ahmed came back to back. But if you use fa, it means after some time. If I say, جَاءَ خَالِدْ ثُمَّ فَاطِمَةً That means Khalid came first, then after some duration, Fatima came. Fa also gives that same meaning. So I remember what my teacher was teaching us is when you're dealing with your parents, things are going to get hot, things are going to get really, you know, crazy. Don't speak to them on the moment. Cool off. A other day, young, young man came to me, one of my students came to me. He said, Yo, man, <clears throat> Ustad, look what happened. I woke up in the morning, my mom was tr throwing a tr tantrum at my, uh, at my sisters. I, told, I went up to her and I was like, Mom, you ignorant. <clears throat> and I was like, and you survived to tell the story. <laughs> that's crazy. And I was like, so what you, like, you walked out of the house, yeah, like, he, he's like, I, you know, I, I, I told her. I was like, you're, you're, you're stupid. Like, you shouldn't have done that. That's not how you address your parent. That's sin, right? So be careful in how you address your parents. If they do something major, give it some time, and then address them. If you need help, seek help. But, <clears throat> You always have to give them the respect. Abu Radullah Ta'ala and his mother was extremely abusive, not only on him, but on the Prophet. And he used to share it with the Prophet. My mother's just going crazy. And he used to seek religious counseling from the Prophet. So don't make rash decisions. Seek counseling if it's something that is beyond your reach. And don't hit the nail while it's hot. Wait. Let it cool off and then come back and address it. I think they, they addressed everything. You know, I mean, you all just. Uh, for myself, I'm going to continue to, uh, to make dua for you all. You know what I mean? We have some beautiful information. And then it, it makes me appreciate uh, my father. Uh, my father would introduce me as I'm uh, 17, 18 years old, pants sagging, earring doubt. And he would introduce me to his friends as his role model. So alhamdulillah, it makes me appreciate my father and, and mother. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you, you are, who are in those situations, we ask that Allah improve your uh, situation. And don't be afraid of seeking therapy. The Imam does not have all of the answers. Would you come to an Imam with a broken leg and say, Imam, uh, fix my leg, we're gonna make dua and take you to the hospital. <laughs> so same thing, if you have some aspects that you need to work out, you go see somebody who uh, has uh, an expertise in that particular field. So, well, is that one more? Is that, can we get one more? Okay. Uh, Word. They pulled a Trump card. So they, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it really, it really depends on the situation. Like for example, I'll tell you, there's a sister, uh, she came and she said, well, I wanna go to the MSA, but my dad won't give me a ride, I really wanna go. I asked her, well, how's your relationship with your father? And she said, well, we're not on good terms. You know? So there's always other problems. It's not the problem that you see. So sometimes your parents may be like, okay, that's just not your career, but that's something that you're really into. Like I'll give you my example. 
in my family, my sister, she wants to be, she's, she's taking creative writing. That's what she wants to major in. But my father's like, what is she gonna write? Writing doesn't make money. And then me and my brother are like, okay, we gotta talk to dad. So we got together as a family out of love and respect. Remember, if you're gonna go try to fix them, that's not gonna work. Out of respect, love and respect, me and my brother, we're older than my sister, she's our baby sister. We sat down with the family, you know, in a counseling session, and we started talking about different, different things about appreciating one another. And me and him, you know, we buttered up our dad properly. Like, properly, we were like, man, you have best, but we meant it, we wanted to appreciate him. We appreciated him, and then we're like, we slowly, slowly eased into the subject of my sister taking creative writing. And I was, I was like, you know, there are people in in Burma that are, you know, dying the genocide. That look at Philistine, what's happening. Look at, you know, in Nigeria, Kenya, what's happening. One day she could tell the stories of our mothers and our sisters and make the whole world hear about it. He was like, that's really good. <laughs> and I'm, so it was it's something really. Like he was completely against it. He was completely against it. And like he put his foot down, he was like, no. And you know, like, so I'm saying, it, it really, I, I believe, work on relationship. Oh, yeah. Work on the relationship. Your parents don't hate you. I mean, that's <laughs> out of the norm, that's not the case. There is a lot of gap in understanding, right? But I tell a lot of people that if you were born in Morocco and you grew up in Morocco or you grew up in India, you'd think the same way as your parents. They are, they are victims to their societies that they grew up in, just like we are, right? So you have to reason with them. Uh, again, uh, it's not a quick solution. You have to, you have to invest. Good.